Okay. My name is Johanna Skouris. I'm an author and a psychotherapist. I wrote a self-help book called Standing Up for Yourself, The Art of Self-Assertion. Today I'm going to do part one uh, and a little bit later I'm going to do part two of assertiveness training techniques. Uh, first I want to just talk a little bit about uh, assertiveness training as it was introduced back in the 80s. Uh, they said, you know, if you want to have muscle, you need to be able to express yourself, don't worry about what other people, uh, take control. But what they forgot to do was to mention that when you have muscle, you may get muscle back. So one of the points that I emphasize in this book is, this is called the art of self-assertion. So by being considerate of other people, uh, I will be able to be far more productive. So the definition of assertion is really standing up for your rights, your needs, and your feelings with consideration of other people's rights, needs, and feelings. Um, I'm going to look briefly at what some folks in an assertiveness training workshop had to say um, over at New Balance workshop, uh, New Balance Athletic Shoes a while ago. We'll look at uh, where is it you need to be assertive? Uh, is it in your professional life or your personal? What has prevented you from being able to speak up as you needed to? And what is your version of an idealized self-image? So let's take a moment to look at what some folks are saying. Person said, I need it in my personal life. Um, I need to learn better to heed my instincts and do what I want, feel comfortable, and then honor it. But in the face of the situation, I don't know what to say or how to get out of a bind. This one says, in my professional life with coworkers, uh, I try to avoid confrontation in the workplace. Uh, I always seem to be trying to please everyone. Um, when I'm being assertive, I'm not sure if I'm really being pushy. I apologize even when I don't, uh, even when I know I don't have to. And I asked, what do you think has kept you from being assertive? One person said, I seem not to know how to say no, and I end up doing things I really don't want to do. I end up feeling trapped. Fear, I'll be unliked or perceived as a bitch. The way I was raised to not rock the boat and not being encouraged to express myself or my feelings. Taught early on, it wasn't nice to speak up and say what you really felt. Fear of confrontation. I need to know how to stand up for myself and my rights by using direct communication. And as far as them being able to express what was considered an idealized self-image, they said somebody who was confident, somebody who has a sense of power and control in their lives. It wasn't a really idealized one, meaning that it's so hard to attain. We all can be at that place. So now, let me give an example. Let's go back to, I said assertion is about rights, needs, and feelings. A lot of people will say, well, what exactly is a right? Fundamental rights, our right to anger and our right to pleasure. Huh. And these two particular powerful feelings are often at the root of a lot of problems with mental health. We may have guilt, shame, fear around expressing either one of them. Um, what is considered a need? Let me give you an example. Let's just say you're at the checkout at the supermarket. You're looking at the bag or putting your bananas at the bottom of a bag. And he puts some box of soap powder on top of it, puts some potatoes, a can of soup, and you're thinking, ah, what are you doing? You're going to crush the bananas. You're thinking it, but the words don't come out. So he gives you the bag and you say, have a good day. And now you go home with your bruised bananas. You had the right to speak up and you had the need. You're paying for those and now you may have to throw them out. So when we look at needs, we have to really identify them quickly, get used to them. But let's look at feelings. This is a major problem with this particular culture. It's very hard to own feelings we have been taught to deny or to repress. So let's look, though, at ourselves in day one when we were babies. Think of that little naked baby sitting at the edge of the beach. Um, the water is lapping his little chubby thighs and he's slapping and he's so happy. He feels anger, he feels frustration, he feels fear, desire, all those emotions. Those are the same emotions that we felt and we still have inside of us today. But 
because of the socialization process, we have probably just learned how to deny them and put them far, far away. And this is the danger because the word implosion means instead of me exploding and expressing my feelings to someone, which another way, <laughs> you really shouldn't, but that's another story. I will take that anger, frustration, resentment, jealousy, and I will turn it inside. So implosion has the dangerous opportunity to lead us to ulcers, migraines, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, insomnia, and maybe even into drugs and all other kinds of self-destructive um, endeavors. So the question is, how am I allowing others to treat me? In other words, and note the big word is, I'm allowing. I have to let people pull me around. And this is where self-hate also has the danger of intervening. Now, when I was in my 20s, uh, a lot of problems, a lot of problems ensued. Um, my relationships stunk. I didn't know uh, how to be able to stand up for myself. I didn't know I even had feelings. So I got some of these nice self-help books that were around, and I began to study them, and I began to realize that I have issues. It wasn't the men that I was involved with. It wasn't even the choices of men. It was me playing a role, a people pleaser, trying to make you happy, maybe at my own expense. So one thing I realized was I have no contact with my feelings. So what I did was, next to my bathroom mirror, I did this. I put this sign up saying, it looks a little lopsided, how do I feel? I placed it right next to the bathroom mirror. So in the morning, brushing teeth, I'd ask myself, how do I feel? Nothing. When you go to bed, put lotion on your hands, how do I feel? Still nothing. It took a long, long time to be able to still slowly start to make contact with feelings. Gradually, I would experience maybe some anger, maybe some frustration, irritation. Getting these negative feelings to become a little bit more comfortable, uh, to own them, never mind express them, this was a major, major breakthrough. But it started with something that basic. Again, now one of the major problems, especially in this culture, is if we give a judgment value to a negative feeling, then we get into dangerous problems because feelings have no judgment. Meaning, let's, let me give an example. Say I'm a married woman who developed this intense crush on my married neighbor. So he comes home from work and I run over to the window to drool and I'm thinking all these thoughts, how much desire I feel towards him. And then suddenly I say, oh my God, I'm married. I shouldn't think these things. I shouldn't even feel this way. Well, hold on. You have the right to feel this way. You just don't have the right to act on those feelings. If that woman runs across the street, grabs this guy and starts smooching, there's a problem. But the right to have the feeling and try to then ask yourself, what's wrong maybe with my relationship, with my husband, my, my marriage, that I can find myself so very, very easily drawn to this individual? That's the whole point of getting in touch with your feelings. It's to alert you to what you feel determines what you do. This is critical that you never forget this because we are still uh, liable for our actions. And part of the problem, like I said, is when we judge those feelings, if she were to say, I shouldn't feel this way, what she's done is she's given a value judgment. It's either good or bad to feel this way, or it's right or wrong. And it is very difficult as a clinician through the years. Uh, it takes a long time for a client to understand that you have the right to the feeling. And you have to be able to allow yourself to recognize feelings are just feelings. What you do with those feelings uh, is different. That's, that's where you are responsible. I have had people say, well, you know, once I get in touch with these feelings, um, I certainly might start to act on them. Yeah, uh, that's true. I'm not going to deny it. So if you're watching this video and you're thinking, hey, this lady's recommending that I ex learn to express myself. So I tell my boss where to get off and I get fired. What, 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 what is this? You have to anticipate consequences. 
we have choices and we have responsibility. Just because those feelings are there and now we're learning to own them and maybe if it's appropriate, I can also learn to express them. Uh, anticipate, hmm, if I say or do this, what might follow? And when we do that, now we start to have much more freedom. Now, one thing that I want to emphasize, actually in part two, is the need, which I'll say right now to tattoo this. You have the right to feel anything. You just don't have the right to act on it. So what you feel is what you do, determines what you do or don't do. And that you are responsible for your actions, not your feelings. And that is basically uh, where I'm going to leave it right at this moment. Uh, I'm, the second part is going to deal with origins of passivity and dependence. Um, I'm also going to look at some of the things that, like passivity, that relates to boundaries. If I can't express, uh, say, how far somebody can go with me, uh, I'm going to learn how the difference is between self-care and selfishness, being able to say no, and, and finally end it with some tips uh, some assertiveness training uh, tech techniques and tips. Uh, so stay tuned, if you will, uh, and I will pursue this uh, shortly thereafter. Bye.